Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, guitarist, composer, and band leader for Conan O'Brien, Jimmy Vavino. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, folks? Out of podcast land, Rich Redman here. It's yep, another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. This is a solo show. Usually, I'm joined by my co-host, co-producer, sidekick, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. Jim had some sort of massive family thing today, so we're getting right into this. Coming, we're both coming from Southern California here, but I'm so excited. I've got a my guest today. Whew, Music business royalty, folks. We're talking, this is an American singer, songwriter, guitarist, and music director and arranger for Conan O'Brien for 28 years, my friend, Jimmy Vavino. Hello. What's up, doing, up I'm good, Redmond. Yeah, man, it's <laughs> I, good to see you. I, 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 uh, I see you. Well, you have a nice, like, black and white. It looks like L.A. and the, or is that New York? You know what? This is New York. What's that building right there? Oh, that's that building. That, that's the Triangle Building. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't this like the Meatpacking right District or something? Broadway and 23rd, right around there, yeah. Well, yeah, you, lived, yeah. In, you lived in New York for a long fire. time. Yeah. Yeah, that's the fire. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's why it looked familiar, but, uh, you know, it looks better in black and white, like everything. It's you know, classy. Just, There's it's, something, yeah, black and white just makes everything so timeless and classic. I, well, all of a sudden, we're like in the 50s or something, man. It's cool. <laughs> But so what have you been doing, man? <laughs> well, you know, what's so funny is that we were texting each other the other day. We caught up. I was on my walk and and we were catching up and I was like, I am so ashamed that I have had your contact information for 11 years and I'm just now getting around to using it. That's OK, man. That's OK. I forgot about you, too. <laughs> you know, so- <laughs> well, well, we met. That's we met. We were, me. we were kind of yeah, like reminiscing and I yeah. met you in Burbank on the set of the Conan O'Brien show when he had the Tonight Show. You were music director and it was really cool because I got to see you like either backstage or in the hallways and you, you were like, hey kid, you sound like Corky yeah. Lang, man. Yeah, he, they were playing like, you sounded like Corky, you must have been playing the cowbell. <laughs> no, but you know, I, know. you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm key, I, I love uh uh records you know and and my whole the, the biggest joy in my life and probably you too it happens with you too is is when people step out of your record collection into your life and you and you're meeting them in the flesh you know so a lot of these guys ginger baker corky lang mitch mitchell i was always keyed into who's who's that drummer and then and then i would say like uh today i said boy Mitch Mitchell would get fired for playing like that today. Oh, he's, <laughs> you know, he, or, he was busy, man. He played like Elvin Jones in a rock band. You yeah, know, he and, sure and did. Ginger, too. But they had a voice, John Bonham. Nobody had a, a sound like John Bonham had, yeah. you know. So, you know, it always came, you know, I learned from Paul Schaefer when I was coming up, he was kind of mentoring me and that records are built from the bottom up, right. you know, and that the bass and drums have to be absolutely right before any of the window dressing goes on top. Because really, what makes you move is the bass and drums. So they have to be married. And learned that from Purdy and all the people I worked with, you know, about Purdy would say, Bernard Purdy would say, well, you know, if your rhythm is louder than my hi-hat, then you're playing too loud. Because then you can't possibly lock in with me. Because when you solo, you can play as loud as you want. And the bass player's got to have his head in my bass drum. And then we can groove. You know? Now, when so, did you work with Purdy? Oh, on and off oh, over the last 30, 40 years, you know, in New York City, you know, awesome. and recently did something with him. But, you know, those guys were, were around and, and Bernard was available to, to, to do gigs and play, you know, and uh, and he always brought something special, you know, and that's what, so I've been always about who's the drummer. People say, who's the drummer? <laughs> you know, that's what I want to know. And uh, because really, when it comes down to it, it's all driven. It's the driver. The drummer is the driver. Well, you know, the rest well, of us passengers, so, you know, with our heads hanging out the window. That's so that, that's re- that was really flattering to me. It's like, you know, to be compared to any established, you know, uh, musician that went on and 
made the music business their bitch, you know, um, is, is a great thing, you know. And so you've had the pleasure of working with uh, some of the greats for probably 28 years with Max Weinberg of Bruce Springsteen fame. And then there's Max, really energetic Max, guy Max, named Max, James you know, Wormworth. For anyone who doesn't know, we'll qualify Corky Lang as the drummer for Mountain. Yeah, do it, do it, it out. Or sorely disrespected by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and that's my political statement. No, for I today. love it. <laughs> uh, and, but, but no, Max and I go back because um, I used to play these Christmas shows in Red Bank, you know, and I would be with uh, Ronnie Spector and Darlene Love, and I was their band leader, and we'd go down and do those Phil Spector things. So I had Steve Jordan as my drummer, you know, and Schaefer yeah. was with me on piano. And, and, uh, and, and Max was there with uh, La Bamba's or jo Southside Johnny or somebody playing with one of those cats. So he was there. And, and I said, hey, Steve, to Jordan, let's set up two kits and get the Spectre thing going. You know, let's get to, let, you, know, you know, Jim Gordon and Hal Blaine or, you know, yeah. whatever, whatever there were sometimes. Uh, you know, and uh, and uh, he said, yeah, let's do it. Two drums, two drummers. So we did it. And that's the first time I've, I've met Max and played with him. And that was in the 80s. Uh, I think the I'm pretty sure it was after Tunnel of Love. So it was kind of when the E Street Band was kind of in flux. Right. It kind of down for a while. So we started working together after that day. You know, we started doing projects. We made a record together and we just started working together. And then I went out. To, and Max had that thing. We, we, could, I, I, we could just n name a drummer and he'd do the fill that the guy did. You know, he had nice. the vocabulary I did. Uh, let's do, do a Hal Blaine here. Boom, 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 boom. You know, at some point in there, do a Ringo that goes backwards. <laughs> you know, because he, yeah. was left, he led with his left hand, you know. Yes. And, uh, and, um, and uh, so we had that same vocabulary. And then I... Uh, through that relationship, we started working together, and uh, and I did, and and I had run into Clarence along the way in other situations, and got to be tight with him, and, and got in. I was in his band, so I was living in Sausalito at at Clarence's house wow. in nineteen ninety three when Max called me at the at Clarence's because he knew I was there, he knew I was where he could get me, and he said, uh, "I got a, I got an audition." with this guy, Conan O'Brien, that's going to, you know, go in after letter, the Letterman slot. And, uh, and don't tell Clarence, because Clarence will take the gig. Because anybody will hire Clarence just because he's Clarence. You want to, he's such, he was such a huge personality. Oh, you know, big person, just stand, yeah. Just stand there and say nothing and be cooler than anybody in the room, you know, without blowing a note. And then this giant thing came out of him that was like monstrous. So I didn't tell Clarence. He said, you got to come back to New York. I don't have a band even, you know. I said, well, here, this guy. This. So we just threw together guys that we knew, guys from my band with my brother and a couple of guys from the Jukes, you know, Pender and La Bamba, that were Asbury Jukes. And in the horn section with my brother, and then I had a rhythm section, uh, except for my drummer couldn't do it now because Max was doing it. So, um, so then we got together and we put a program for our audition. We were going up against really hip downtown bands like the Lounge Lizards, like John Lurie, you know, the, the, the Sex Mob, those guys that, that were really, you know, way cool. And, and, and since uh, Howard Shore was involved, uh, through through Broadway Video, which is uh, Lauren Michaels' company, uh -huh. you know Howard feed into him and uh, into uh, you know into all of those really ultra hip bands, and Conan was like looking for a party band, <laughs> you know he was looking for a band to, to have a good time. Well, so, that's cool that you guys had to audition. Oh, I mean, yeah. that's yeah. So against thirty bands in New York, you know. And, uh, and, and um, somehow we put it together, but we had things going for us in, in the way that we had a performance ready, you know, to entertain. And, you know, yeah. we learned this from people over the years. And, and to, with all due respect to practicing your ass off and learning all your scales and playing all this lightning shit, you got to know how to work, you know. And you, and you have to know that people, you, you can't go over their heads. You have to entertain. So some of these bands, as great as they were that were auditioning, they were too hip for the room, you know? I mean, really, this was national TV, and these were commercial breaks, you know, going in and out and keeping the energy going. 
So it was something that we all learned to do along the way, playing in bars, you know? Yeah. I mean, so we were a glorified bar band, yes. And, and some, you know, people were, well, these guys aren't world-class musicians like Bradford Marsalis, and, you know, and they're not. Well, who cares? You know, I mean, can we entertain? That's oh, point. you guys were always fun. And then at the end, the camera would be up or up on Max, and he'd be, da, la, 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 bang! And then because he point, would know, would know yeah. where the camera was coming in, and oh. then do what the Beatles did. And they learned this in, they learned this in Hamburg, mock show, and no matter what. The German said, Mach show, Mach show. And John would put a toilet seat over his head and make everybody laugh. Yeah. You know, because, you know, you're there for the duration, man. You're there. You're not too hit for the room. you got you got to work the room. And, and then uh, at some point, they would start going really tight on you on the end of songs and stuff, too. And you were you had your kind of like, yeah, your, you know, your was, stuff. You know, you only have to come alive for three seconds on TV. <laughs> But yeah, that's, but no, know, I, the, the repertoire was great. The repertoire was just like dum dum da da dum dum that kind of stuff, or like dinks. It was always sounded like the song. The entire song was like the shout chorus. You well, know, it was like the, that. We got to play all through the commercial. We didn't stop. Great. So we entertained the audience through that commercial. And you know, we had a thing too about oh, let's you know, we had to get rid of introductions to songs and stuff. You know. Right. If you have a, you know, you have a song like uh, "Burning Down the House" by Talking Heads, and you go with that. You have to go right in. You can't do the introduction, or you no. you lose the energy. You know, so it's really just a slam. You know, like a like a beer bong, man. You know? Yeah. Right down your throat. Well, That's you know what's funny? I, I always loved, um, and you might have some, you definitely have some insights on this, but whenever Max couldn't do the show and James Wormworth would come and sub with you guys, it always, he always looked like this kid in a candy shop. He was like, oh my God, I love my life. You know, like he was just like, oh, yes. I, I met him, uh, I met him, Mike Merritt, the bass player, who uh, uh, I, I met first at the Lone Star. We were doing a gig maybe with Benny King or somebody. And then I learned that Mike was Jimmy Merritt's son from the Jazz Messengers, you know, played on Monin and all that stuff, you know, right. and a Philadelphia guy who, who it, uh, on the Saturday morning when he got up and there were cats coming over like Coltrane and Philly Joe Jones, they were coming from the gig to, to Mike's father's house right. at six in the morning with a bag of donuts for the kids, you know. Awesome. Grew up around this jazz royalty. And he uh, was the one that introduced me to Johnny Johnson. So when we put the band together for Johnny Johnson, Mike brought Worm in and myself. Uh, so, and that was, uh, you know, Johnny Johnson was the, that was the turning point in me, you know, uh, in blues royalty. I mean, I had played with a lot of guys. I backed up a lot of guys always and, and women, all, more women than men through yeah. my life. I mean, Odetta, Phoebe Snow, Laura Nero, you know, um, just all of the, all the girls from the 60s, you know, Darlene Love, Ronnie Spector, every one of them, Martha awesome. Reed, all of them. But, but the, the real, being in a blues band that plays like three sets a night with Johnny Johnson on piano is like, that is real school. You know, that's, that's the real deal. So then I, I always knew that as much as I could play everything, because I started as a trumpet player, and an arranger and oh, writing nice. for orchestra. I was writing for orchestra and big band in eighth and ninth grade. You know, I just like that was natural to me was to orchestrate and arrange. As much as I liked all that, the blues was always the thing that got me. Those Chicago blues records and those Mississippi and Memphis and Texas. And I got into all the regions and finding the different grooves, the different yeah. drummers, the different styles, you know, that rub shuffle from Texas, totally different from the Chicago two handed shuffle. You know, and then there's the shuffle that the guy used to play with uh, 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 Ernest Tubb. You know, that was this, this country shuffle. Right. That was like a flat tire shuffle. Boom. And now no one plays a shuffle. I was talking to the kids, you know, they, the kids don't do the shuffle. It's just because the they don't hear it on the radio. You know what I mean? But it was yeah, so funny. The key, and, and I've had this discussion with Steve Jordan forever, and that is the underlying feel of everything. Yes. If it's not swinging underneath it, you know, there's, you, you can swing, you can hear the shuffle between the spaces. If somebody's swinging on a straight groove, even, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. I mean, English guys had a bottom shuffle. They went from the bass drum, boom, 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 bo
shuffle, two, 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 two handed shuffle, and the bass drum just boom, 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 you know. The English guy said it's two, 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 and that becomes, two, 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 two. you know, it gets really guys with two bass drums going, two, 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 oh, you know? yeah, and then, and then so you chase it, it back. It's a different shuffle, but it, but a shuffle is essential, uh, as is a straight rock beat and a rumba, you know, that, yeah. that, that. Like New Orleans rumba, boom, the rap book. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's all Pe essential. People don't know how they're, how, you know, obviously we have different types of people on this show, but I know a lot of drummers. We get a lot of drummers on here. So the audience is a lot of drummers, and they are so lucky today because they're getting that perspective from somebody who's worked with a million drummers. And oh, you're right, right, there's so many different types of shuffles. And even like if you like, you know, that, that you're talking about that Texas skiffle where it's like um, Ricky Fatar's like, do, 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 but Frosty, who used to play with Lee Michaels, also lived in Austin. And yes. all these guys had playing with Jimmy Vaughn, you know. Uh, and so and, and then Whooper Layton, you know, with Stevie Ray had, the had best. a thing. And all the guys, Cran Christina and Mike Cran uh, Fran Christina and Mike Buck, who played with the Thunderbirds, had that thing. You know, they had that shuffle. That's yeah, that's key. And and I know that that uh, you know, it's the it's it's the benchmark or the determiner as to whether a guy gets a gig in Austin is <laughs> his shuffle. Oh, you wow. know, it, it's the, it is the, it's the high watermark in, in Texas. And, uh, you know, and then there's, there's uh, the Memphis groove, man, that great, you know, Al Jackson groove. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and one time uh, the, the greatest is um, one time Tony Williams sat in with us and Tony Williams, you know, we were, we had a thing where we're doing fours and then it comes around into Trump and he goes, he just stops for the whole four, and then he comes back in. And, wow! And you can feel the swing in that space, you know. And he was just saying, "Does everybody have good time, or am I responsible for everybody's time?" Because <laughs> that, that was a good, that was a yeah, good test. Anton Fig said to me once we were doing a, a session for something, and uh, you know, I, it was my session. I had Anton and Will, and you know, I can't remember. Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, Leon Pendarvis on organ, you know, and, and we were cutting a track and Hiram might have been on guitar too. And we were cutting a track and I said to the engineer, uh, just give the, you know, Mr. Big, right? I said, just give Anton the click, all right? And the rest of us will play along with him. And Anton goes, oh, hold on. Why should I be responsible for your bad time? <laughs> give everybody the click. Oh, you man. Know, and, and as you know, your drummer audience would know playing along with a click is a tricky thing. You can't play on the click. You know, you have to play around the click because you have to make it playing sound like you're playing with no click. Right. That's the art to that, you yeah. know, that push pull. Uh, Steve Jordan, again, I go back to him because he's the master, talks about the, the, the push pull of Al Jackson, you know, which is, which is uh, back on the two. So if you're playing boom, bop, boom, bop, you. Your four is a little on top of it, but your two pulls back. Wow. So there's a there's a feel that happens when you're doing that. You you can exaggerate it and it'd be it'll sound ridiculous. But once you find that fine line of back on the two, it just pulls the whole band. You know, otherwise guitar players will just fly. They'll yeah. just they just keep going. You know, we just a lot of us study playing fast, you know, and, and drummers, I had a friend that he would put the click on, put a, a metronome on, and just come four. down with all four things with the metronome at once until it wasn't flaming, until none of them were flaming. That's until, great. you know, and try it. It yeah. seems easy, you know, but it's like doing it's like doing a shot of beer every minute, you know? It seems like you're not going to get drunk, but you're going to go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's crucial <laughs> to have that subdivision in there. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, you know, the, the, the independence of drummers uh, – fascinates me uh you know uh Dijonet would say the, the the groove is coming from anywhere on the kit don't think it's just coming from the bass drum or the yeah. you know so it's the whole kit and and uh and drummers are better uh they have better time they have more chops but they have less swing as we said uh in a lot of ways you know uh the music doesn't require it as much Right. So it's a good thing to get into, though, man, and, and dig those different styles uh, that were the pioneers. The roots really go all the way back into the 30s of rock and roll with drummers like Chick Webb, guys like that, you know, yeah. that are rock, 
You know, they're yes. rocking. They're, they're yeah, buddy. Rich. Woo. <laughs> Gene <laughs> Krupa was rocking, man. Gene Krupa, oh, and he, he was rocking, man. He's the kid father of rock and roll drumming. You know, showmanship because he's also he's also got the thing Dino Donelli had with the you know with the Rascals. And that was the, you know, twirling the sticks and throwing them up and, and that, that whole boom, 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 and making that face, you know, <laughs> go, yeah. go. I mean, yeah. I got the stick twirls uh, from a friend of yours, you know, Carmine Apathy. I mean, you know what I mean? So like I yeah. stole that from him and you know, it's so funny this week. He, <laughs> he stole it from Dino. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause those, those guys. We, we, I talked to Carmine. We did a thing for Timmy Bogart a, a while back, one of these kind yeah. of Zoom things. Had a panel, and Billy Sheehan was on there, and, and a bunch of other bass players, and, and me and Vinnie Martell, and, and then Mark Stein, the guys from The Fudge were there. And we were talking about that, those days when Carmine and his band would go and watch The Rascals, you know, and, and would also go and watch, watch Leslie West and The Vagrants. So all these bands were highly competitive, and they, came, they hit it within a year of each other, all of them, everything was compressed time-wise that, you know, you made, people made two albums a year, you know, no problem back in yeah. those days. That's why and someone then, like, you know, Frank Zappa, who died in his early fifties, he ha already yeah. had like a hundred records under his belt. And then you'd look at somebody like say a Tito Puente. I think when he died, he had 108 records under his belt. It's incredible. Yeah. I yeah, mean, just the Beatles incredible. did everything. They did everything over eight years. Seven, seven, except that Ringo personally said when I said, how long, how long, you know, I, th I said it was actually only seven years. It's amazing. He goes, no, actually it's eight because I did a, a, a drum, a, a cymbal overdub on Long and Winding Road in 1970, uh, 70. So it goes from 62 to 70, he says, wow. you know, uh, you, you know, and, uh, and I did ask him, uh, I did ask him the big question, you know, I, I, I was, I was compelled to ask Ringo this question. And I said, uh, okay, man, you, what was it like, you know, to be in the biggest band in, in the UK and then be asked to join the Beatles? <laughs> and he said, oh yes, I was with Rory Storm in the Hurricanes making more money than anybody, you know, I was making 50 pounds of, a week or something. He said, and, I, and, I, and I, I took a pay cut to join this Beatles band. I said, yeah, but it turned out pretty good for you, man. And he was a difference maker. His mercy beat is, uh, you know, nobody talks about Ringo now the way they did in 1964 when everybody was anti-Beatles as musicians. We right. all learned. Everybody learned, but those, uh, but the jazz musicians in and and session musicians in America were kind of just like taken aback. They didn't get this thing. But when you listen to Ringo's playing, go go ahead and do it. You do it, yeah. And now these new mixes, the mono ones, where you really hear feel that Mercy bass drum, boom, yeah. boom. You know, it's like. Yeah, and look at that Washington video where he's playing so hard the drums are flying away from him, you know? I mean, just to think, you know, to to play Shea Stadium and the girls are screaming so loud and the audiovisual equipment was way under par. It wasn't like the, we didn't have modern hardware. The cymbal stands are moving. He didn't, it was not playing with a click track. They could barely hear each other. And he, the guy's playing rock solid time. Yes, and they had some side fills, no wedges, right? And, and, and the thing is that, that, that they put in the 10,000 hours yep. as a band and didn't even have to hear each other anymore because they were, they were beating. One heart was beating, you know? So and they were so young to have been so accomplished. And thank God that happened. I mean, 1964 was a game changer for so many musicians. Yeah, yeah. And they had been touring all over England since 62. So they were putting in the time. And, and yeah. before that, I think it was in 61, maybe was the first time Ringo started sitting in with them, you know, and, and they were noticing the difference. You know, well, they were no, wow, it comes yeah. to life. So, well, I mean, yeah. and Paul McCartney can pick up any musical instrument. He can pick up a set of bagpipes and within 30 minutes, the guy's playing it like, he could yeah. make that, you know, I think, you know, like Sting is kind of the same way. I mean, he could pick up any musical instrument. He's making beautiful yeah. music on it. Brian Jones was like that. Yeah. 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 Um, this weekend, after I talked to you, I had a, it was like a Jimmy Vivino playlist party on Spotify. So I went to go hear this live record that you have on there. I think it's called 13. It came out in 2013. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, yeah, we haven't even gotten it to leave on Helm as a drummer. That's like oh, yeah, we we get we could definitely talk about that. But it's so funny. There's a playlist on Spotify. It's called Jimmy Vivino's Blues Covers Uncovered Playlist, and I could definitely see the history of blues and then the current state of like people, modern guys doing. But but this some of these guys have got to be your heroes. Your Howlin' Wolves, your Muddy Waters, your BB yeah. Kings, your Robert Johnsons, your Sonny Boy Williams. Who yeah. was the first guy that said that? Where you said I'm gonna do that. Bloomfield. There Mike you go. Bloomfield. Mike yeah. Bloomfield. Because, because um, in Chicago, you know, the Butterfield Band was the first integrated band. You know, they had an African-American rhythm section with Sam Lay on drums and Jerome Arnold on bass. And they had a they had a, the best rhythm section. So that's why they're better than the Yardbirds. They're better than the Rolling Stones as a blues band. They're better than they than than even Fleetwood Mac as a blues band, who were great, by the way, who were wow. just up uh, tops. And even Mayo, they're better than the Mayo band at wow. the same time in 1964 five. All right. Because to, with all due respect, those English cats, they they, they scraped the money together to buy 78s from sailors and learn learn these songs and put them on and learn them as well as they could, you know, uh, being out there discovering this thing. And Sonny Boy Williamson, when he went over there to play, he said, these English boys want to play the blues so bad, and they do. <laughs> <laughs> but he, was a wit. he was a witty guy. But with all due respect, those guys were listening to Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters and Otis Rush and Freddie King. Butterfield and Bloomfield, right? They were playing on stage with M Muddy Waters, Alan Wolf, you know, and all these cats. They, you know, they knew these guys. They were rubbing shoulders with them. They were on stage with them. They were allowed up on stage and they were respected and they got it right. So that when I heard those guys and then I figured out that he was the guitar player on Highway 61 too, you know, then it was like, oh, okay, this guy has got some shit. And Mike had all kinds of stuff going on. And he just kept, you know, when they tried to make a rock star out of him, they tried to make him a guitar hero. He just started going backwards and finding porch blues. And, and he would show up at a gig by himself with no shoes and sit on a fucking chair and play Sleepy John Estes songs. And everybody would be pissed off yelling for whatever they were yelling for, you know, because he wasn't taking that as a, he didn't see him, like Clapton didn't see himself as a guitar god. And kind of in his own way did the same thing. He went back and made those tributes. You know, Eric is, feels indebted, as Mike did, and as a lot of these guys do, and I do, to the guys that came before us, the pioneers, the, those African-American blues guys from all over the country. And yeah. then it gets regional. You find, you know, when I, when I got to the West Coast uh, in, in the uh, early 90s or late 80s, and played some festivals with Mark Maftelin, who was the piano player for uh, the Butterfield Band. Uh, we would play with L Lowell Falson all of a sudden and, and those ca all the cats that were out here. So I found out about all the West Coast guys and the sound. And there was a different sound in every region, you know. So that I started, and, and the historian in me wants to know what was going on. What the hell was in the water in Seattle that Quincy Jones and Hendrix came out of there? What was going on? Well, most of them were port cities where hmm. sales come in, you know, and, and records and things came in from all over the world. So there, you know, uh, Hendrix had a deep, a deep appreciation for the blues, too, you know, yeah. for Muddy Water and Albert King and, and Bob Dylan. You know, that's where that's where his filter, it filters into Jimi Hendrix all of a sudden. It's those three things, you know, Albert King. Muddy Waters and Bob Dylan, and then you get Hendrix. So it's there's nobody without influence. So nobody's really stealing from anybody. It's all borrowed, and it's all it's all a big textbook if you look at it that way. Yeah, I mean, you you hear a lot of the old, you know, the 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 the, the guys on the porch that are just playing that old. I mean, it is hair raising haunting you could hear the pain yeah. yeah well the same with the same with the appalachians though when yeah. you see uh, that 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 great uh great uh, documentary called high and lonesome you know where they go and find these guys that are like 
pipe fitters and mailmen and farmers during the day and they get on the porch with their guitar or their banjo and they smoke anybody who thinks they're a bluegrass genius, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's just better. And, they, and Larry Campbell, my friend Larry Campbell, who's a great guitar player and multi-instrumentalist, you know, he always tells me he goes down to, back down to Tennessee, to Jacksonville or wherever, and, and, and sits on the porch with these guys because his wife is from down there. And he has his mandolin, but there's guys that, you know, have missing fingers that play from thrasher accidents that play mandolin better than Sam Bush. Sorry, Sam. It might yeah. be true. <laughs> you know, wow. so it's, yeah. uh, you know, that music, all that music has a root uh, and, and, it, and it's not meant to stand still. So, you know, that music is not, uh, especially when you talk about bluegrass, blues, jazz, improvisational music, it is not meant to be, to take that record and learn every note on that record and play it that way every time you play. That would be a Broadway show in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. So it's about, can you get the feel? And this is where it all comes back to drummers. And the feel is the main thing. You can play a lot less burning licks if you can play a groove, you know? You, you, gotta, you gotta learn the groove. I mean, that's, you know, James Brown's band were so disciplined, right, in that. And those, a lot of those guys could play a lot of shit, you know, but they didn't. You go, yeah. boom, doo 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 Try doing that for 20 minutes and never lose it. You know? Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, you know anyway, that, it's, uh, you know, that Maceo record, Life on Planet Groove, from about 25 years ago. Yeah. And it's Ken with yeah. Nard on drums. And Maceo is like, we played 2% jazz and 98% funky stuff. Yes. And they are yeah. just on fire. Man, what a great recording. I did a week at the Blue Note with Johnny Johnson, opposite those guys. So we would open the show, yeah. our little blue quartet, you know, playing blues. And, and, uh, and, and, and Johnny liked to play a lot of, uh, you know, stuff, a lot of uh, Count Basie and stuff like that, inst piano instrumentals, along with blues and Boogie Woogie. He was a nice. great Boogie Woogie player. And then those guys would come out. And it was, at that time, it was Maceo and Fred, right, Wesley, and St. Clair Pinckney on tenor, right? So they had, they had that, no trumpet, two saxes and a bone. And they had Melvin Parker, who was the brother, the brother of, of uh, Maceo on drums. Oh, wow. Larry, Gold, Larry Golding's on B3 playing pedals, you know, no bass player. Yeah. And Rodney, on, Rodney, on, Rodney Jones on guitar, who was just, he might be on that record, of the Planet Funk record. Rod, Rodney wow. might be. And they were like, and I, I was like, it was killing, man. It was so funky. And it was, it was a notch beyond what James Brown did because they opened shit up and played solos. Solos, yeah. You know, and, they, and they, so they, they took the basic groove sandwich, you know, the head, and did the jazz thing with it. When yeah. they opened it up, they gutted it, man. And they opened it up and shit came out. Every night was a joy to, to just to, and I would never usually do an opening act for a week and then watch the other act from, you know, all the way through. But every night, those guys were. Yeah, fun. man. Well, I listened, like I said, when I was listening to you on Spotify, then Spotify, the algorithm kicks in. And before you knew it, know it, I was listening to Albert King, Cream, Vanilla Fudge, Mountain, Cactus, uh, yeah. you know, 30 days in the hole, baby, like all that kind of stuff. I was like, wow. Oh, all, I saw all those bands at the Fillmore and the, and the Academy of Music and the Capitol Theater. You know, I started at 13 going to the Fillmore and saw these bands play. So it was a, it was an education. Uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't. Um, wow. I can't believe you did that. It was like, yeah, we all do this. We all go to these shows. Yeah. You know, we all go and see these bands and then we want to do that and we and we and and they're like we're like the little kids looking over the fence we want to get in the game you know and yeah. so and then i you know i remember i went to see al cooper who who ends up being my best friend in the world you know now but then i would never talk to him or bloomfield i was afraid to on the social level but i went to see al and he didn't show up so that that i said oh this really sucks man now at least Proko Harum is on the show, you know, and uh, and they're opening the show. But who's going to close? So we get there and the birds are closing the show. 
But this bird has Clarence White. This is his first tour with them. Clarence White on guitar, you know. He was, and, and it was like mean and lean birds in 1968, 69. And Clarence White had that B-bender, you know. He had that guitar. And he was from the Kentucky Colonel, so he was a bluegrass cat. But he also was one of the greatest electric players. And I was blown away. I said, I'm glad I saw this because Clarence White didn't live that long. I think he got hit by a car yeah. or something. Something terrible happened. His brother was with him. I don't know if they were changing a tire or what it was. Oh, it was God. a tra tragic thing, but he was amazing. So, And then Robin Trower at the time with Proko Harum, that was where I got the bug to get a gold top. He had a, good, a Les Paul gold top and a red Marshall. <laughs> you know, and I said, oh, that's, that's the sound. You now, know, what's, I, the, what's, the, what's the quote on JimmyVivino.com? It's like right on the homepage. You're, my favorite guitar is the one I don't have yet. Uh, yeah, well, it's something like the one I don't have or the one that you're playing, you know? It's something, something <laughs> the, yeah, the one I don't have, you know? But, but I, I don't collect. I play them. Neither do I. You know, I, I wouldn't collect, you know, I wouldn't, you know, what do you, I know guys have 50 snare drums and never use them. Okay. Well, that's okay. You know, that's, a, rent them out to somebody, let them get played. You know, and the oh, guitar, yeah. the guitars, I've been, I, I've turned my collection, if you want to call it that, over at least 10 times. Sure. You know, at least 10 times. Things are gone. And then if I see something, I walk in a locker and go, what the hell? I haven't seen that in 10 years. Get rid of it. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't, how many do you need? Uh, you need, well, when you start thinking about it, Muddy Waters had one telly. Yeah, man, you know, if I don't, if, I don't, if I'm not using a piece of gear, I'm like, sell it. I'll buy a leather jacket. That's what I collect. I, that, I love, I, that, I, that's a leather jacket right there. That's That'll my thing right here, baby. You know. Yeah, I, I, you know, and, and, and the other thing was, uh, there was a picture somebody sent me of Cream's gear backstage. And there, there's a Firebird case that says Cream on it, and there's a Les Paul case that says Cream on it. That's Eric Clapton's gear. That's it. The amp is on stage. There's two guitars, you know, one is a spare. He'll play the one guitar till a string breaks, but he won't have to do what me and everybody else, you know, I've seen Mike Campbell change guitars in the middle of a song. Wow. <laughs> Seamlessly, because it, re it required it. Sure. So we're, so we're, we're, and, and it's part of the fun too, I think, uh, you know, people want to see, my buddy Joe Bonamassa, he's got the collection and he blames me for his habit, but that's yeah. not, <laughs> I knew his father. I do know his father and his father, uh, we would do these things uh, at five towns college, his guitar show, vintage guitar shows. And Joe was a little, you know, 11 year, 12 year old kid at his father's booth. Hey, Mr. Vivino, can I, can I show you something? And he would have this, like, you would have a flying V on and it was like huge on him. And he was burning already at like 12 years old. He was yeah, amazing, you know, and, and he was just this little nerdy little kid. And uh, he's turned into a great player and a, and, and a performer and showman and, and the biggest collector I know. He, you know, he really played, built a beautiful audience for himself. He really did well. Well, you know, he sort of shunned the system. The system was broke anyway, as you and I know. Yeah. Uh, the record business was at, as it was was dead so he made his own own business and it worked great you know i uh, it doesn't work for everybody you got to have the goods there's no for luck sure. involved in that. there yeah. is no nobody anyone who says oh he's lucky well they're just jealous the rich redmond show will be right back those who are self-employed especially musicians think home ownership is unattainable for bruce klein it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician but once he did man was it satisfying so he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey if you're a self-employed musician he can help go to musiciansmortgage.com powered by movement mortgage bruce klein nmls number one four six five nine four eight movement mortgage supports equal housing opportunity NMLS, number 39179, NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. 
Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. I tell all my students, like, look, if you have haters, and you will, you, if you have haters, you're doing something right. So just persist, like own your shit and just keep moving forward and everything will work out great. But I talk a lot about the idea of relationships and how people in any career path are the gatekeepers to success in life. And you've had this 28-year relationship with Conan, who himself is fancies himself a guitar player, right? Doesn't he do a lot well, of shredding backstage? Maybe it's maybe I, I'm only feeding him a little bit of information so I can stay with him for 35 years. But uh, <laughs> he's doing great. No, he, he's really got something. And, and we have that connection. We had that connection right away. You know, it was it was through Rockabilly and Gretsch Guitars. And we just yeah. talked about dirty shit, you know. Well, he's and, got that uh, Rockabilly haircut, man. Well, he's natural. He's got the best Rockabilly hair. I'm so jealous. I have no hair. But uh but it's always been fun, you know, because he would say, yeah, hell yeah. Hey, can we get, let's get Scotty Moore on. Yeah, let's get Scotty Moore on. You know, let's get, uh, you know, all, we had the Sun Rhythm section. We had Carl Perkins, you know, and uh, just, just all kinds of, all kinds of sets there all the time, you know. And, uh, and I, I said, to, uh, it was great when Carl Perkins was there because Carl Perkins ended up playing on the Johnny Cash show in the 60s. When you watch that Derek and the Domino uh, appearance, you'll see Carl Perkins in the end doing, I think they're, maybe they're doing Matchbox in the end. And then Carl's playing on his old, uh, you know, micro frets guitar. And so Carl came on the show and I asked him, uh, I said, you know, you uh, spent some time playing in Johnny Cash's band, but Luther Perkins was his guitar player. Are you guys related? And he said, well, Son, I ain't saying we are, I ain't saying we ain't. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, and I never want to know what it means. But yeah. uh, both great guitar players. And, uh, and you know, in the, and Nashville is like Austin. You throw a rock and you hit a great guitar player, no matter yes. what. Into a crowd, you're going to hit a guitar player. You know, and a great one at that. You know, and it's always been a guitar city. So, uh, you know, it's not what it used to be. <laughs> Broadway is like a... <laughs> rock show <laughs> bachelorette party now but yeah, that's it's a, okay <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's like yeah when i'm back in the day when dinosaurs roamed the earth and i moved to nashville in 97 like we you know i i really had to do a crash course in like tammy wynette's greatest hits and you know all the stuff i did like i hit the kid from connecticut did his research learned it i would go and i'd be on stage and i'd follow and i learned to speak that language and now the language down there is it's, it's all just like it's anything from like Jimmy Buffett to Leonard Skinner to Jason Aldean at warp yes. speeds. Yes. It's cl yes. classic rock bands, but there's a couple of holdouts down there. Of course, any tourist that goes there, I say, make sure you go to Robert's Western World. That's where the yeah. door is way high it, uh, up in the up in the air through the window, and they just play traditional honky tonk music with an upright bass player. Yeah, which when is really I, fun. I, I first went there. Back in the, in, in, I guess the early '90s, uh, in late '80s, early '90s, and and the Cats were uh, Greg Morrow. Yeah, Greg and, is still killing it. Yep. Chad Cromwell. Those were the those were the A guys back yep. then. And you Chad know? is, and, and they're Warf, still in the mix. I knew Glenn Wharf and uh, and John Gardner and and uh, you know the guys in the Blue Bloods. You know, knew Mike Henderson. So Dude, I knew Mike Henderson. He played in Open Sea, and Mike Henderson also made the best moonshine I've ever had in my life. Oh, so, did he make it in his uh, bathtub? I don't know. I gave him a, a silver tone, just like the one he had. I said, you know what? I'm not worthy of this. Here, have a spare. So he like made me a case of moonshine and drove it up to New York. <laughs> wow. Said, well, you well, know, you can't fly with this. <laughs> I used to watch those guys every Monday night at the, um, the Bluebird, which is, That's you know, right. like howling right. ground. It's like our bitter end. Reese joined him too after a while. Yeah, yeah. Reese Wine play with them. Yeah, 
I haven't seen wow. John Gardner forever. Yeah, he's great. He's like Levon. He plays like Levon. Well, talk about that. You, when did you work with Levon? Well, Levon and I, you know, I, I met Levon way back when he was, you know, in that second incarnation of the band when they started up again in 85 or 84, whatever that was. It could have been 83. I don't know. And I'd run across him now and then. And I was always the huge, to me, the best American band ever, you know, and uh, everything. It, and the new release of Stage Fright proves it. The live stuff on there. Right. Just the best. And and so, and I'd run into him when I played with Johnny Johnson at the Chicago Blues Festival. And, you know, with Hubert Sumlin, I would run into him at, at, at festivals and stuff. And then I had a place up in Woodstock and Sebastian took me over because John and I had a jug band together at the time, you know, we, with Fritz Richmond and, uh, and Greg, and, you know, just uh, Paul Rang, Paul, uh, Rochelle and Annie Rains, a whole bunch of people. We had a jug, a revolving door jug band. And, uh, and I said, Hey, take me over to Levon's. He says, Oh yeah. He's just, man, he's like, you can throw a rock and hit his place through the woods. You know, I right. said, well, I'll drive you up there. So we drove up there and we get up there and, and uh, he's got, Coke bottles, empty Coke bottles stacked to the ceiling on the porch. You know, he was a Coca-Cola freak. And uh, so we went in and, and uh, you know, he remembered me and from, from uh, various situations. And then uh, maybe a year or two later, he got sick. Hmm. He got the cancer, you know. And, uh, and I, was, um, I was doing an a instructional video with Johnny Johnson for uh for for homespun tapes for happy trail so we were at the at the bearsville theater doing a doing a, a video and and uh levon comes straight from cancer radiation treatment and his throat is like red like ruby red and he's got aloe on there trying to trying to calm it down and did he smoke a lot like cigarettes uh he did up until that point yeah. <laughs> you know and uh and and steam was coming off him. His the radiation was so fresh, but he just had to come and meet Johnny Johnson, you know. Wow. And he called. He named me Jimmy V because Favino is not in the Arkansas phone book. So it was just got to be too much of a hassle to say the name. So Jimmy V, it's Jimmy. Hey Jimmy V, we ought to take Johnny over to the barn and record him. <laughs> I said, okay, you know. So I, I, I rented a piano, you know, a grand piano. I got Johnny, I had Levon, I had uh, d different cats come in and play. I had Rick Danko come and play, and, uh, and, and Garth did some stuff. And, and my guys, Mike and Worm, Mike Merritt and James Wormworth played, Sebastian played some, and we cut some st tracks. And, uh, you know, I, I started to turn it into a record. And, and uh, then there was a whole other set of tracks with the current band at that time uh you know and um guys started dying out from under the project you know and i so i put i shelved it i still have wow. a shelf i haven't put it out i haven't finished it i just felt bad and now i don't know it's kind of past it you know it was 19 yeah. something you know it's almost 30 years ago but i got the tape somewhere and so levon and i got to be friends and 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 he was really sick and i'd go visit him all the time and he said, Jimmy V, nobody will hire me because I can't sing. Uh, I said, start a blues band, man. We'll call it the Barn Burners in honor of all the barns that you've burnt down in your time. <laughs> 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 Nodding out with a cigarette or whatever. And so we started the Barn Burners and we started playing around, you know. Yeah. Every, uh, he loved to work. He loved to play. Then finally he said one day, you know what? I don't know about this going out on the road crap anymore. Why don't we start a thing? a midnight ramble at my, at my barn and have people come and bring food just like we did in Arkansas. You know, we'll have a ramble. We'll have all kinds of people come and play and, you know, people will buy a ticket and they'll come. And I said, well, it's another wacky. He had these Ralph Cramden kind of ideas, you know, but, yeah, but then one, you look at Daryl's place and that was kind of like the, the model for that live from Daryl's well, place, right? That place came afterwards. Yeah. And so, yeah. Did, and, and so did Terrapin station. Uh, up in, uh, I guess, ter I guess Terrapin something or other. Phil Lesh came and played, and then he started a place up north here in California doing yeah. the same thing, having a ramble. So it was uh, successful. It, Levon got three Grammys in the last 10, that last 10 year encore of his life when he should have died. He got three Grammys. The band never had any. Can you believe that? Wow. That's how, 
that's how messed up that shit is, you know, that the band didn't have any is bad enough. But then Levon comes back after all the, the hassle he had with business with, with the band, you know, just, just problems. He gets three Grammys uh, on three beautiful records that Larry Campbell produced that are just great, you know? So, wow. so, you know, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a bittersweet, you know, ending yeah. to it. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and it was the well, best playing and singing. It was one oh. thing. It was one thing, you know? Well, to me, it's the Don Henley thing. And this is what I like to tell my drum students. It's like, pretend that you are singing the song because Don Henley is not going to distract from his groove when he is singing the song to step on his you, own vocals. You've heard that too. You've heard guys grunting while they're playing. Mm, uh, kind of like, uh, yeah. You know, singing, like Keith Jarrett. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes, but you know, you don't, that's the other thing too. It's almost the BB King thing you're talking about where BB singing, he doesn't blow over himself. He finishes a phrase and then he answers. Then he himself. fills. Yes. Yes. That's, Call and response. You know, and that, it, it's, music is not about waiting for your solo or your fill, which is, which is a natural thing for a young person who can play the shit out of that fill. <laughs> He's yeah. like waiting. It's coming. It's coming, but you've losing the concentration of yeah. what your job really is. You know, yeah. that fill's going to be there when you play it because you, you got your shit together. So like you said, the confidence you have to have the confidence and you have to not be anxious because you're going to play a lot of music in your lifetime and it all ain't going to happen on one song. Sorry. <laughs> Same with your solos, you know? Yeah. And that's something so, you, uh, it comes with time. It does. And this is a marathon, not a sprint. And you know what I like? Another thing I like about your career, you've had so many side projects where it's just like, literally you could just say it's Jimmy Vivino and the recuperators. And, yep. the, and you just change the name of and the, and here's another outlet that you can use to take on the road and go entertain people, put product out. I mean, yep. I'm already thinking, what would, God, what would I be? Would I be rocking Richie and the something that would be, I would, you know, I got to have a little something in, in the, in the gun here. Well, you know, because of the, because of the way that, uh, that music playing music was structured when I grew up, it was about playing live, you know? Yeah. And I have, and the little big band, me and Harvey Brooks on bass and Jeff Young and Gary Gold, who lives in Nashville now, was playing drums. And, you know, we had a, we had a band and we played at a place every week up, uptown, you know, called Hades. And, and I knew cats, they would come in, Warren Haynes would come in, you know, and he would bring Dickie Betts with them. Or he'd bring Johnny, you know, Johnny, the, the blind piano player that, oh, it was so great. Oh, Johnny Neal. Yeah, Johnny Neal, who's it? Jimmy, let me tell you something. Who <laughs> <laughs> was unbelievable. Matt, you know, Matt. Unbelievable. Johnny, you know, and cats would come up. I remember meeting Dwayne Betts at a uh, playing at a joint I was playing, and he was like 15 or 14, and he came up and played. And 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 when we played uptown, Donald Fagan lived around the corner, so he would come and watch us. And then one day I said, You want to play? He goes, eh, okay. Let's do down along the cove. Let's do this Bob Dylan. I said, I don't know if we know it. He pulls a chart out of his pocket here. <laughs> and he had his melodica and he came up and sang and did that. So little by little, we were working some gigs together. And, and um, Libby Titus, who was his, not his wife at the time, uh, she, put, she put together uh, these New York rock and soul reviews, New York Nights, where, you know, we would have a band that Donald would say, okay, put the band together. Let's and I and I would try to convince him to do Steely Dan songs as much as I could, and he would say to me, "Why don't you go put some platform shoes and bell bottoms on and look at yourself in the mirror?" <laughs> but changed his mind since then, because you know a lot of artists, you know a lot of artists like to think that their career is just perpetually in motion and nobody's going to care about what you did twenty, thirty years ago. But that's not true, right? So they find he finally him and a lot of other people I work with, you know, Paul Schaefer used to tell me, build it, make it right. And the minute you play it, they will come back to the record and realize how great it was. Yeah. A lot of guys you got to realize and women too have gone through such shitty bands, not knowing the record really well, that they're kind of this, they're kind of like jaded about, ah, and they walk through it. But if the band is good, the artist is good. Yeah. And it doesn't work the other way. The artist being good is not enough for the band to be good. 
It can be travesty. It can be horrible. I sure. went through this for Sumlin. People wouldn't learn the wolf material the right way. And then Hubert, some people are reactive players. You know, he's a reactive. If it's right, if it's, if it's right, all of a sudden that shit starts coming out. If it's not, he, he would say to me, Jimmy, I played with this band last week. They got me worried. <laughs> because they're looking at him. You don't look at a guy like Hubert Sumlin or Johnny Johnson and say, okay, run the show. You know, you, 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 you make the bed comfortable for them, and all of a sudden they do this great shit. You know, yeah. so it's about, the, it's about respect for the artist, no matter what kind of music you're playing. If somebody had a record, they're already a step ahead of you, aren't they, if you're a backup musician? So yeah. learn the damn record. Play it right, you know, and nothing is corny. You'll find out that nothing nothing is too corny, man. Shit is – music is uh, – it's not up to us to decide what's cool. The yeah. audience decide what they came to see. But anyway, Fagan, so he – you know, then one night playing at the Lone Star, somebody says to me, Walter's in the house. I said, get out of here. He goes, yeah, look, I look along the wall and there's, there's Walter Becker and he's kind of just like, you know, wallflower against the wall. So I, like, with big, big mouth, I said, Walter, over the mic. <laughs> he couldn't, he got, he got shamed into coming up. So he comes up, I gave him my strat and that was it. Within like a couple of months, Steely Dan was back together. Those guys were back together. So I, I'm not saying it was all up to me. But I sure forced the issue and said, I want to see that. I want to see these guys together, you know, and they and they had a good run together. They played live more in that those what what 15, 20 years or whatever when they got back together. More there was more Steely Dan out there than ever was because they never played. You know, when we were kids listening to them, they never you couldn't go see them. Yeah. <laughs> Asia never played. Gaucho never played anywhere, you know? Yeah, it worked out great for my buddy Keith Carlock because he got the gig, you know, out of UNT, you know? I knew him from playing with David Johansson. Yeah, you know? see, and did you did you meet my buddy Brian Delaney in uh, yeah. Johansson's band? Uh-huh, yeah. Well, Johansson <laughs> is a, another one of my buddies, you know? And so we we put together that Howlin' for Hubert uh, pro yeah. project where David was singing. I, I, somebody... People were looking at me like I was crazy. They didn't know Johansson. They figured, what's he going to come out and address New York Dolls? I do hot, hot, hot. Guy who's got the bit. Him and Joey Ramone had the deepest record collections of any two guys I knew that were in that New York rock and roll scene I, that I refused to call punk because they were rock and roll. You know, and, and so Johansson knows everything. And he knows the Wolf thing. And Brian Mitchell's playing piano and... and uh, Mike Merritt on bass and Levon on drums and yeah. Hubert and me are the guitar players. So that's where Hubert started singing again. Uh, Le Levon started singing again on one of those gigs after we'd been doing it for a while. He said, Hey, I think I'll sing one. He says, what do you want to sing? He said, going to main street by muddy waters. I said, we got it. Let's go. And he started singing. And from there it went to the rambles and all that shit started happening. But um, I would play when I played with, I, I was lucky enough to play with Laura Nero, uh, Phoebe Snow, Odetta, these 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 icons, you know, yeah. uh, and to learn um, a different sensitivity from those women, from from different than from the men that I worked with, uh, you know, there's a different, there's a, a, a and I, I'm 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 too old to say there's not a difference between men and women. I don't think there is not a not not from what I've, my explorations, but, and also it's not just physiological, you know, it's philosophical. Yeah. It's, a, it's a nurturing of the band that guys don't do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a, it's a demanding a certain, uh, a certain behavior, which a lot of male band leaders don't quite do unless you're yeah. James Brown. And then you just find everybody because yeah. <laughs> you can't get, fine. but somehow, um, there's a, uh, there's an, an instinct, uh, and, and people, some people will write in and be pissed off that I say this, that there's a difference between well, no, the way I, there, women yeah. approach, you know, uh, and, and it's been the healthiest nurturing in my life to have worked with both equally, uh, put an equal amount of time, uh, and, uh, and occasionally, 
you know, uh, it, it's a different world now. We have more inclusion than ever. Mm -hmm. You got more drummers. I got more guitar players yep. burning up the house, right? So uh, With less opportunities to work. Well, a groove is, uh, a woman's yeah. got the groove, man. She's carrying, yeah. she's carrying a lot of groove through life, you know? And, and yeah. uh, I'm glad to see it open up where it wasn't that open years ago, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, no, I and worked for a lot of female artists that I always enjoyed it. There was a different, there was a different insensitivity to dynamics, to um, their sensitivity to tempo. They like a laser focus on tempo. Like I, when I worked with Pam Tillis, Mel Tillis's daughter for three years, she could tell the difference between 85 and 86. And we would, we would tour abroad and it'd be like, was the power the same on your metronome? It was, it's like, well, maybe, you know, the voltage, I don't know, but you just time do it with the smart, you know what built, I mean? Built in time clock. And yeah. Darlene used to say, like me and the drummer, Leo, this great drummer, Leo Damian played with me with, with Darlene Love. He was a New York session cat. He was deep, you know, great drummer. But we would have these conversations about the time. We'd yeah. be back and forth at rehearsal, like, well, you know, and Leo would say, and he was right. Well, you know, uh, it, it picks, up in the chorus a little and then and it comes back down and Darlene finally got fed up you want to know where the time is watch my butt <laughs> that's where that's the time is when I'm singing in front of y'all and I'm moving that's where the time is you don't you know and, and and I said you know what it comes from the singer it does it comes from the singer everything yeah. from the vocal you know after it all in all we talk about the bottom the bass the drums the parts the horns the strings it's not a singer can just sing a song with no accompaniment. And if they're great, it's there. There's the yeah. song. And that's, you know, that's, and you ought to be doing that when you're soloing, you know, because depending on the music and I, 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 I have to say in my world, you know, yes. In the, yes. If you're playing in a thrash heavy metal, you know, some sort of speed metal band, you're going to need all that shit. Right. You can't play like B.B. King in that situation, you know. So, yes, there's room for everything. Um, yeah. That didn't exist as the fastest guys, you know, were Alvin Lee when I was a kid, you know, and yeah. Johnny, you know, and that and that was considered fast. And that's nothing. It wasn't even accurate like today. You know, Eddie Van Halen comes along and changes the game. You know, he he's a game changer. When people asked about Eddie's passing, I said, that's a that's a that is a catalyst. That's yeah. more than a great musician. That's a catalyst. You know? Guys like that come along every 20 years and change the game. You know, they change the whole landscape. Yeah. Now, I was just, I was curious. You were talking about Corky Lang and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What happened? Well, there's no mountain. Not in, mountain isn't ah. in there. Gotcha. No, I thought like mountain. Joe Bonamassa and I have a thing every year. We pass around the hundred people that should be in that aren't, you know, and, uh, and you'll, you'll be shocked to find people like Benny King and Carol King. All right are not in the rock and roll. First of all, if you wrote Stand By Me, okay, and you had a hit record with it, and everybody covered it for a century, almost, <laughs> half a right. century, you go in, that's it. You did that, you know, any, and any one song, when you walk into a guitar center, and this took, it took a while for, for Deep Purple to get in. I think they just got in like two years ago. It's after very political. John yeah, after John Lord died, but you walk into a guitar center for 30 years and you hear smoke on the water from some little eight year old, you're in. Sorry, that is Rock and Roll Hall of Fame stuff. That's yes. what makes it important is how the public feels about that. No Jethro Tull, you know, no Chicago. Why? Because they had hit records. There's also a backlash to, oh, you got too, too commercial. Well, that's not true. Look at all of all the commercial R and B and hip hop acts that are in Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, and it's not just the Pop Hall of Fame, by the way. You know, it's kind of it's a funny it's a it's a very very it's a t it's a touchy a sticky wicket as they say in Britain because because yes everybody can't be in but maybe there needs to be an alternate hall you know where where at least King Crimson can be allowed in. <laughs> because yeah. to me, that pro prog rock was an important thing and it led to Van Halen, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, that led to the yes, you know, what Steve Howe was playing, that was sparking Eddie Van Halen to do what he did. So they don't have any room for influences anymore. For a while, they tried to do that. But, uh, you know, catalyst, game changers, influence, 
and riff masters, you know, people who, yeah. you know, you know, I, I, you know, that's, that's, that's a, it's a, every year around this time, it's a real thorn in my side because I, you know, I, I don't understand the pecking order of that politics, but yeah, we can all go get the records and listen to them and screw watching the hall of fame thing. So <laughs> it's just, yeah. yeah. Spotify is great for that. Like you said, though, it just like starts feeding you stuff what, that fits an algorithm of what the record you were listening to is playing. So you're going to get traffic and Johnny Winter and all of my influences coming. My Fillmore shows are going to start coming over Spotify to you if you. <laughs> it's, it's, so, bands, oh, you know? it's so beautiful to, 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 to have those algorithms all kick in and you start going down memory lane. Like I said, it's like before you know it, I'm like you know, listening to Bad Company and Humble Pie and Cactus and, and just, and you could just hear all the air between the notes and you can hear the guys listening to each other and yeah. start listening to those early Rod Stewart, Every Picture Tells a Story, those Faces records. Oh, so and you could, you could tell they just got, they just went to the pub and got smashed and then they went back to the recording studio and there's mistakes that they left. And it's like, that would never happen nowadays. How about Mick Waller on that record you just mentioned? How about I his drug? That's so great. And so how about how, and the weird, the weird thing too, uh, when you talk about that, Kenny Jones and Mick Waller sound like the same guy. Yeah. You know, Kenny's on Maggie May. He sounds like Mick Waller. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it's, I, it's, 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 it's uncanny. It's a sound. It might've been the studio. Might have been the drums were tuned that way when they walked in. You know, I don't know. Guys didn't, you know, in, in 1970, whatever, they didn't have a drum tech coming in to tune the drums before the session. Oh, well, that's how Ainsley Dunbar left him. Okay, well, I'll play him that way. <laughs> you know. Totally. And that was the sound. That's where I had got into a conversation with somebody like Dan Pan or somebody about studios having a sound, you know. And uh, and we talked about Muscle Shoals a little bit, you know, having its own sound. And I found a picture. I think maybe Spooner told me this. Yeah, they had everything set. You didn't touch a knob when you walked in because that was their sound. And Motown had the same thing. They had the guy. They Motown had this sort of a pole. It was a square pole with a guitar input and a little car speaker with a volume control. Right. No head. And you plug your guitar in there. It goes either direct into the board or into some amp that's somewhere, you know. And you and you hear the sound come out of that of the whole band coming out of that little speaker while you're playing. And oh you're, my god! And you you don't say, "Hey, I got to turn up. I don't like my sound." No, the engineer and the producer decided what your sound was, you know. And and at and at Muscle Shoals, there was a shelf above the guitar players' heads, and there oh, were a couple jets up there. And there's a picture of Wilson Pickett with Bobby Womack and Jimmy Johnson, uh, you know, um, and, and, and Bobby Womack and Jimmy Johnson are the guitar players and Pickett's just talking to them. And coming down off of that shelf are coil cords. And off the shelf, the coil cords go into your guitar. The amps are above your head and you don't touch them. The sound is set. That's it. So the studio has a sound. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't get messed with. And you know a record came out of Stacks or came out of Muscle Shoals, or came out of Motown, or came out of, you know, Chicago, or even even in New York, you know, they had certain sound to them. And, uh, you know, now there's the control is all, you know, there's too many tracks. There's too many, <laughs> you know, too many apps, too many pedals. Too know, many tracks, too many apps, too many pedals. Let yeah. me ask you this, that, that, that kind of nickname that uh, Levon gave you, Jimmy V., You've been doing a great job keeping up with the crazy kids on Instagram. You have Jimmy V Music is your handle yeah. on Instagram, and you're playing a lot of songs. You want to play a song for us today? I'm just going backwards, but it is. Uh, I know that this might not air today, probably. But no, we but, we well, we're, it'll be out soon. I, I I have like 20 that I keep in the queue, and I drip them out. So we're gonna drip you out, man. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna how's the sound? <laughs> Beautiful. All right, it is International Women's Day today. It is. In Laura Nero, and I've I've been on a mission uh, since playing with her to reclaim the respect for this song that Blood, Sweat, and Tears uh, de destroyed, that they ruined. Uh, it's not a corny song. 
It's not, it's called And When I Die. And this is uh, what was intended. I'm not scared of dying. I know, I know so many guitar players that are like, man, dude, slide is such its own thing. I don't even want to try it. You know, it's, uh, I, I, there's so many different styles. You get, you, get, you get a monster like Sonny Landreth that, you know, he has found it to be the only way to play guitar. And Derek Trucks, too. You know, they can both play straight up, too. You know, and Warren Haynes. But then you also find the Rory Blocks of the world and, the, you know, the people who, who play that Delta style, you know, open tune style, that's a, a, a different thing. So it's a, a slide guitar is a muddy waters used to say the closest thing to a human voice because you get those semitones when you're, you know, it's not like, it's not like hitting a note on a piano and it's there. Yeah. You, you, you know, when you hit a note, you come up to it or come from above it and come down, you know, there's different ways and it's like bending a string, but a lot more, you know, like a, like a human voice. So uh, I think uh, everybody should mess around with it. You I know? think so too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, why, why limit yourself, man? Pick up, you know, I, I, I remember when I was a kid and I couldn't, uh, and I, I had a, a guitar with like three strings. Well, I just started learning some bass lines off it. I remember learning the bass line to uh, some Beatles songs, you know, not knowing what a note was. None of that's important to, to say to yourself, well, I don't know what the chords are, what the note is, so I don't know, you know. Uh, Hank Williams Jr. used to say, 
when somebody would argue over what chord it was, he would say, I don't know what you call it, but that ain't it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> one of, and he would know. He would know. And Bruce Springsteen would say, I don't know what it is. It's it's one of them demolished chords. <laughs> you know, because no. there's a sense of humor that goes with what, what you know, people should never feel some of the greatest artists in the world don't even know what a note is, you know, what the name of the note on the guitar or the piano or the trumpet or the sax or the, you know, what, you know, what the rudiment is, you know, what's a paradiddle, well, they can play it. You know, you don't have to get hung up with education, though it's a good thing, but the best education is just sitting there and figuring shit out for yourself. Find your own way to play it. And YouTube, my God, it just opens up everything. Yeah. If you got, I have a question. You know, and I'll look to I'll 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 I'll, I'll go to Marty Schwartz. You know, who's a, this guy who just a, a guy I know called Marty Schwartz that usually has it right. I say, what 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 would what, what Marty do? I need a bumper sticker. What would Marty do? <laughs> because <laughs> no, because it's um, some people really are great at dissecting and 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 then dishing it out for people to learn. But the there's no we know from watching people play upside down like Albert King, <laughs> maybe they've got it right side up. Right. You know, nobody ever said you can't do this. And, uh, you know, that's that the humans left to their own devices are pretty amazing. Yeah. I, I, I had a teacher say, Hey, don't let your education get in, in the, don't get, don't let school get in the way of your education. No. In other no. words, you're not going to, you're not going to learn everything in school. You got to get out there and apply it. I, if that's right. I will always said that I said the strong, the, the best, thing I can do for anybody is tell them about how to work and, and what it takes to work because, you know, God bless all these kids that are shredding in their rooms, you know, and playing some amazing shit. But I also say, I have a saying that I like to, that's twisted because it has to include baseball. When a baseball player hits the ball, he doesn't drop down and do push-ups. He runs to first base. You don't play your exercises when you're doing it, when you're doing a gig. You know, that's for limbering up and warming up. And then you're supposed to go like Hubert Sumlin, heart to hand and leave the head out of it, yeah. you know, and it's the heartbeat to the hand and, and, and it's making music and it's playing well with others. It's having a conversation within the band and boy, there's nothing better than sitting in a groove with a rhythm section. Yeah. That's, you know, there's it's nothing. Beautiful. Yeah. There's no, there's no burning, you know, shredding soul that's better than the way Booker T and the MGs play. There just isn't to me, to me, for me. Ah, oh, you can disagree because it's America. <laughs> you know, you should. <laughs> <laughs> so people, you know, have gotten to see that joy on your face for 28 years working with Conan. What are your responsibilities for Conan now, now that the, like the band? Well, now, I, now I make, I, 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 you know, I make, I have, I'm building the library up and I make, I make bumpers and I make music for bits and I make, you know, whenever we're doing, uh, you know, videotape commercials and things, I make music or film trailers or whatever. So it's mostly uh, me and my engineer doing stuff at this point. We're finishing up this run, uh, this version in June, and then we're starting up an HBO Max show. Nice. Uh, that's the next venture. I don't even know to have any details on that, but I know it just, uh, you know, we ain't done. And, uh, yeah. and the delivery system keeps changing. You know, it was network when we started and cable right. didn't mean anything. Then it was all cable and network didn't mean anything, you know, and, and, and all of that stuff is, is changing again. Yeah. It's, it's changing again. And, and look what we're doing. We couldn't do this five years ago. I don't think we could have a zoom call. Yeah. Maybe I mean, even, could, if, I, even if the, yeah, I mean, even if the pandemic pandemic wasn't happening, I want to do an interview with you and I'm spending the majority of my time in Nashville. I couldn't have you on as a guest, but this levels no. the playing field, you know? Yeah. And we'd have to, you know, we'd have to meet up somewhere and yeah. do it, you know? And then, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, th th there's, th th if you got, you got to find the good in this thing, totally. you know, because we can all go cra absolutely crazy. And me, I'm just going backwards and exploring old songs the way Mike B Bloomfield did and the way well, other cats that I, I admire did. And I keep going backwards and fun, but I'm trying to do them my own way. You know, so I, I did something today. I, I think I played a, a song by Dale Hawkins called Little Pig today. And I threw in a Keith Richard riff 
from Can't You Hear Me Knocking? And somebody wrote in saying, oh, is that where that came from? I said, no, but I stole it from Keith. Like, you know, like it's, it's, it's borrowing, you know, yeah. you try to make it, you try to put all the ingredients you gather in your life into the stew that you're, that you're making. And so like, I always say, man, it, it, it's admirable to be able to sit there and play every note of a solo that somebody else played, but they couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you, if you transcribe every note of a John Coltrane solo, he'd look at it and go, give yeah. me my horn. That was that, that was a moment in time that was captured. Yeah. No, I mean it's so, it's great. It, it's like archaeology, you know, to do that. Do you uh do you make a good sauce, a red sauce? Are you kidding? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's a survival course. I got I gotta have I gotta try that eventually. This was so fun, man. This is the kind of thing that can go on for hours. I gotta I actually gotta jump into a faculty meeting for Musicians Institute, but we're right around the corner from each other. I hope this all goes away i know it will it'll come back i want to come see you play i want to connect with you i want to try your red sauce and yeah, i want to tell everybody for sure i want to I, I want to i want to tell everybody to make sure that they visit your website jimmyvavino.com and on instagram you're jimmy v muse at jimmy v music check check yeah. out all the great stuff you're doing there man thanks so much for your time today man thank you thank you we'll play together one day corky oh dude i can't <laughs> wait i cannot wait and to all the listeners out there thank you so much for your support i got an email address for you the rich redmond show at gmail.com and as always subscribe share rate review we sure appreciate it keep coming back for the good stuff thanks jimmy thank you <laughs> all right i'm out awesome thank you brother this has been the rich redmond show subscribe rate and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.